is there anyone in the audience that will be wishing to speak on an item that is not already on our agenda? All right. Dr. Pelletier, any adjustments that you're aware yes, of? Yes, the uh, adjustment, I believe there will be some people that would like to uh, speak to the school calendar. And uh, what I'm going to recommend is we call this the first reading and bring it back in a month to get the input from the people. Okay, um, that's listed under your report. Right. So this will be considered the first reading? Uh -huh. All right. But that won't necessitate a change on the agenda, however, will it? No. It will be continuing in the same place. All right. Unless, Madam Chairman, uh, I don't see the people that want to react, so uh, maybe if they're not here by the time we get there, you may want to delay it until we right. Okay. All right, we need to consider the minutes of our March 13th meeting. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Then do I hear a motion that we accept the minutes? I move to accept the minutes. Second. All right, second by Mr. Hall. All in favor? Right. Business manager's report. Thank you. LaBelle? Page 49 of your agendas, we have for you the revenues for the general program. To date, we have received 76% or $6.1 million out of a possible $8,119,000. Revenues projected are, should be as, as, uh, as projected. The following page summarizes the expenditures of the general program uh, with 71% 70, of the total budget expended as of uh, March 30th. Any questions on that page? There will be a slight adjustment on the, uh, if you notice up on the co-curricular, I believe some of the fridge benefits uh, uh, amounts have been posted too much to that account. That's why it's 110% expense. D, there is, <coughs> superintendent has requested that there be a freeze on expenditures. How much do we think we're gonna be able to save with the freeze that's been talked about? Hopefully, I believe sometimes in mid-February, I think Dr. Pelletier came out with a memo uh, when we started the budget process, we anticipated $250,000 as a year-end balance. This was uh, comprised mostly of the, the uh, bond issue that uh, the town got for the schools last year to do the roofs and a few, quite a few other projects. Uh, of that, the, the note payment is only due July 1st, which I believe is $60,000 with some $22,000 of interest. Also, at that, what happened in, in June of last year, when we, the year end came about, we had, I believe, like seven or eight, eight teachers retiring from the district. And what we did at that point, we like paid their, their summer pays, plus I think one or two of them uh, qualified for a, uh, a years. And by doing that, we say, thousand dollars out of this year's budget well, we got the state printout as far as what Cape Elizabeth might or could anticipate for revenues for next year we put a freeze because we felt that the 250 would not be enough to to uh, create as big a, a balance as we would like to 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 lessen the blow on the town side or the town commitment for the Cape schools for next year. And by doing that, we upped the year-end balance to $350,000, anticipating $100,000 to be picked up from the freeze from mid-February to end of June. It's hard to say. I th think I'll have a better hold on it come April 30th, next month. We have, you know, said no to quite a few things. And do you have the state has, at least through some committee that I read in the paper this morning, authorized additional funds for schools. Do we have any idea what that? No. I talked to the state this morning, and uh, what that means to Cape Elizabeth is $31,800 mm. of the $10 million. Mm. The, th the amount that you don't read about that, that Cape Elizabeth loses quite a bit off the two amounts is last year, I believe, the, the, uh, the 
state gave to the town $77,000 in property tax relief monies, along with the, the, the cut that is an unknown, and it's, it's not in the papers, but we, we qualify for a quality incentive bonus because we do spend over and above the state allocation towards per pupil cost. And that amount is $124,000. We will lose 50% of that, or 62000 So, But that's, you know, you don't read about that in the paper. But it is realistic. So. Uh, hopefully, we will come up to 350 come June 30th. I believe some equipment that was budgeted for or uh, possible uh, supplies, it, it comes from probably, I don't know, four or five hundred accounts. Every account is being looked at, Charlie. And I guess what we're saying is that if you haven't, if you haven't ordered that typewriter that your secretary might need, you're not going to get it this year. Field trips. Field trips. You know, it's a lot some of... Some commitments that we made, you know, we made commitments for field trips is early. The, the I just buying. want to make a comment there. Sure. Uh, since we don't use accrual yeah. basis accounting, I don't think that's a significant figure, and I don't think it has anything to do with the cost of the school lunch in the middle school. No, it has. It has the, the significant, I was going to mention that, Peter, but the significant factor here is that, uh, true, it's not. It's a cash basis. However, looking at the beginning and ending, ending inventories, we're pretty much the same. They vary about, about $1,200 or something. I think we're just buying or we've we've had quite a bit of food purchase in the past and we're kind of you know easing off using what we've got yes, Jane. but what would be uh, I apologize for interrupting you earlier if you were going to say that but what would the effect of the increase be out of the 6800 did it, it did it even take uh, it took effect, effect for uh, one week I believe right That's 19th uh, week and a half so it really has nothing to do with that increase we should notice that come April, but then April being uh, a month we don't, with well vacation next week, so we're going to see, you know, the the uh, the revenue is way down because of that one week less. Uh, it'd be interesting come May. May is a full month. Jan, do you think tonight that we might be able to set a date for the workshop? It, we've talked about it for a long time, and and I think we really need to meet about that, and and also. During the workshop time, I'd really like to see a breakdown of the food cost and the labor for each individual school. That's what we're doing. If I don't know if you want a, a, a whole night for that. We thought of maybe prior to next board meeting. Start at, I don't know, 6 o'clock or something. Start at 6. Sure, we have four meetings. We'll have four meetings scheduled for May. Mm -hmm. And in June, with 
all of the social things that go on. We thought probably at the next board meeting, they could put it on the agenda and spend a half an hour or so. During the board meeting? Could, during. I'd rather. Uh, or if you want a well, let's give public notice that we will be having a workshop at 6 o'clock mm -hmm. before the next board meeting. Mm -hmm. and, and those who are and By then, we'll have, uh, we're working on the budget for next year, and we have, we have identified a, a budget as a whole, but now what we've, we've done is gone back to the schools and said, well, we want a budget for each school. My reason for suggesting that is I think it could be a full agenda yeah. if the language arts and some of the programs that we are tabling tonight are put back on the, uh, okay. on the agenda. So let's do that ahead of time. So but I will have, have the, the director present and also the, uh, the managers of the three schools. Great. Thank you. So why, why the $34,000? Why a significant, mm -hmm. such a significant cash figure? Did we get some? 34 for what? Oh, the, uh, the March the cash sales. Full month. It's uh, I forget how many days of operation, but that makes a, a sizable difference. Plus, what probably happened, or I know what happened, is is the end of uh, February. I believe you had two days of February. The, the revenues went to March. Which March? Because that's ten thousand dollars more than. What we're going to do though is, is next year I'm going to set up a, a form that's quite different than this, and we'll both you report like on an accrual type basis. So each month will you know be more actuals and not. Because if you pay a lot of bills one month, you're losing money. If you don't, then you're making money. Okay. Uh, the following page is the community services. Today, they've received, they collected $358,000 and expended $262,000. Last but not least is the enrollment reports for April, April 1st. And this is the report that's going to be used for our state subsidy, or half of it for next year. Uh, the elementary school, K-5, is 814 students, up one from last month. And up, oh Lord, what is it, 70, 75 from last year. The middle school has got 335 students, up down one from last month, but up three from last year. And the high school is at 424 students down one from last month and 47 from last year. I'd like to bring to your attention the kindergarten enrollments. Hmm. You'll note that 120 versus 103. I have received today from the principal the first preliminary registrations. And uh, if those hold, uh, we may possibly need another half a kindergarten teacher. Uh, I don't know where these young people are coming from, but uh, they're coming to us. Was it 138? We have over 130 listed at this point. And last year, I think we had 95. So something's happening. I would hope uh, that there isn't another bulge, because uh, if there is, we're going to have to sort of put our heads together and do something a lot sooner than we thought. Any other questions? Any other questions for Mr. Bell? Thank you. Right, thank you very much. We'll move on to our comments by our high school representatives. I think they're both here tonight. Um, last, let's see, March 30th, which is a Friday night, the community team sponsored a high school dance and it was from 8.30 to 11.30. It was very successful. We had quite a large turnout. Uh, we had some raffles, so it made it more exciting. And we're looking forward to some more dances. And the seniors had a Chiwanki trip. Not everyone went, but everyone had the opportunity to go. They were gone for three days. That was last Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And they enjoyed some of the same activities as the sixth graders do. And um, except for the rain, I guess the trip was very successful. And Jennifer, the how, how many went? Do, do you know? Maybe. I think about a third. Yeah, well, quite a few people. And the Spain trip, which left April 5th, they're scheduled to get back the 26th, so we'll be hearing more about that, too. Thank you. Um, also, this past month, the people from the drama club who put on the, the play Rage, which is a Stephen King story, they competed in the districts in Madomic Valley, and they did very well. Um, two of the actors were recognized um, by being named to the all-festival all cast. 
and also the entire play was awarded an ensemble award for their outstanding work as a team. So the whole department was very proud of that. And also um, the newest theater project, which is the musical Anything Goes, is now um, being planned. It's going to be complete with student acting, uh, student orchestra, and chorus, and opening night scheduled for May 31st. So we're all looking forward to that. Um, also, the speech districts were held on March 24th. And out of the five categories that send representatives uh, to San Jose, California, the nationals this year, um, our high school was able to place uh, people at the top in all five categories. Um, so five out of the five representatives to the nationals from the state of Maine in speech um, will be from our high school. So we're all really proud of that. And have, lastly, do you have their names? Um, the Brian O'Donnell uh, was in foreign extemp. Um, Kate Greenwood was in uh, Original Oratory. Um, from Humorous was Dan Berman. Um, domestic Extemp uh, was myself. And Dramatic Interpretation uh, was Lee Foote. So the trip will be June 16th. Um, we leave. And then we'll be going to San Jose to compete for a week. So looking forward to that. Congratulations to you and to okay. Brian back on the, the camera and, and to all of you. Excuse me, I think you had more to say, oh. and I'm really <laughs> proud of that. <laughs> oh, um, yes, just one last thing. Um, Earth Day, the 20th anniversary of, um, I guess, a celebration of, of trying to make the communities of the world more aware of the environment, uh, is being held April 22nd. And to recognize that, um, the SAC and some, some, a committee of concerned faculty have put together uh, quite a program for our high school to take part in that. Um, we're going to be having some speakers, uh, fundraisers to actually buy some acreage of rainforest in South America, making things like t-shirts and planting trees outside, all to, to make sure that, um, that maybe just, if not for a week, you know, if not for that long, just for a week, um, that we perhaps can be more aware of our environment around us. And Earth Day, I know, has been going on for a long time, and, and I think it's good that the high school itself is starting to get involved. So. Thank you. I have a couple comments. Yes. I want to compliment the high school on their fine arts night. I was it was my first attendance at a fine arts night, and I was very impressed with the, the talent in both art, music, and the one-act play presentation. And I compliment the high school, the students. The second is just a comment on the, the high school dance. Um, I believe Frank told me that there was around 170, or somewhere between 170 and 190 kids and majority of those were underclassmen, freshmen and sophomores. So evidently there is a need, especially for the underclassmen, for this kind of um, socialization. And I'm glad that they conducted themselves in, in an appropriate manner. And I compliment the, the community team for sponsoring the dance. Yeah. Um, also, there is one more thing. The, the um, SAC was curious as to what the status is of um, the plan to move the eighth graders to the high school, um, where exactly that is at this point. Um, we'll be addressing be that to tonight. Know. Okay, thank you. So we do have a plan. Thank you both. We'll move on to the superintendent's report. <coughs> the first item on the superintendent's report is the approval of our 1990-91 school calendar. Yes, Madam. Chairman, the, uh, the calendar for next year, and uh, I would hope that uh, we have this approved uh, a month from now, but that uh, basically the calendar will hopefully stay the same because we're getting large numbers of calls. Let me say a few things about the calendar. Uh, this calendar calls for 175 school days for students, six teacher days, and we always plan on five snow days. Uh, one of the unique parts of this is that there would be a two-week vacation at Christmas for the students, and the teachers would return on the 3rd and 4th of January for workshop days. This uh, makes a very excellent time for workshop days, and at the same time gives the students uh, vacation where they can do a number of things. Also, this calendar calls for a, a one hour shortened day every Monday and does away with the shortened day on Wednesday that we had this year. And that day, uh, the administrators and the curriculum director will work on curriculum. Uh, 
exclusively the, or that, no, that, not that exclusively type, yeah. it, it'll vary from school to school based on their needs yes um, also we are changing we want to change the time the school starts and what we'd like to do is start the middle school and the high school at the same time and let me uh, clarify that that would help us in a number of ways one that will reduce approximately 12 bus runs in a year that we're looking to save any kind of money we can find time for the bus drivers and it would benefit the school uh, school day now I received a call tonight that there are some parents who would like to speak to that and are concerned and madam chairman this may be an appropriate time uh, to hear their concerns yes I, I'd like to very much <coughs> Ms. Stanford Anine Stanford, co-president of the um, Education Association. The association met a week ago today in a general session because we hadn't had an opportunity to do that during the year. And with so many issues surrounding us lately with regard to next year's programs and the budget, we decided it would be a good idea. During the session, we discovered it seemed to be a consensus from many of the people in the buildings that they hadn't had a sufficient amount of time to react to and to give input concerning the calendar for next year so it ended up in a vote to send a letter of request to you asking that uh, perhaps we could be given a little bit more time to talk with teachers and poll teachers in the different buildings to find out how they felt particularly about the ex early release time on Mondays and the teacher days in uh, January as Dr. Pelletier just outlined. We're going to meet again May 2nd as a total association, but in the meantime, we could be, through our representatives of the units in each building, be getting some input and could send that to you for your consideration before the calendar is finalized in your a meeting a month from now. We appreciate you um, tabling this item for next time. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Reed? Good evening, Rosemary Reed, middle school parent. Um, I would like to address my concerns to the 7.30 start time and the co-mingling of middle school um, students with high school students and also the uh, 2 o'clock release time of grade 6, 7, and 8 and the problems that could be posed with uh, after school athletics because of scheduling of practices uh, now or after that release time. Thank you. I mean, why wouldn't the athletics uh, would, would, would you like to expand on each of those? Yeah, I, I think I, you mentioned about five things, and, and you might want to give some background into what your concerns are of each. Yes. Um, Mr. Leslie, the um, concern about the athletics is there's a proposed 2 o'clock release time. Many of the teachers who are coaches um, are in the fourth and fifth grade. Example, Mr. Joe Doan is a coach of uh, a lot of the middle, several of the middle school athletics, and he will not be released from school until three o'clock, according to the proposal. So that, therefore, probably the extracurricular middle school activities will not be able to start until after the um, elementary unit is released. Anyway, my concern is, what do the middle school students do between? two o'clock in the 3.15 or 3.30 start of practice. Uh, as far as loitering, uh, we already know the problems with Cumberland Farms, CVS, House of Pizza. Also, are the kids going to be sent home on the bus and then expected to be back to school on time for practice? Um, 
In a four season sports, which we have, there's a five day practice. Practice needs to be um, attended or the, the uh, students are not able to play in the games. Coaches are very, very, um, it's very important for our students to as attend as many practices as possible. And, and how many coaches are involved? Well, the, the ones that come to my mind sir, are um, uh, Joe Doan, who is uh, cross country um, basketball, uh, and he's a fifth grade coach. And I, I, I wish I had thought about this in advance, but I'm sorry, I did not. But I mean, the other thing is um, in the sports that are not uh, middle school sponsored, the fifth and sixth grade play in the soccer travel team in the fall. They play in the basketball league in the winter and in Little League in the spring. And again, with uh, fifth and sixth grade age um, students mixed, we still have a problem with that extra hour um, of release. I'm also concerned that with a 7.30 start time, many students will have to get on the bus uh, between 10 minutes of and five past seven. The current sixth grade class is entering the middle school for the second time. Um, currently, they start class around uh, 10 minutes of 9. They will now have a start time of 7.30. Um, this is the same class who was middle school and had a start time of uh, around, uh, I'm sorry, I've lost the times, but my son is a fourth grader, had one start time. As a fifth grader, had a half hour later start time. And now as a sixth grader, we'll be expected to start school at 7.30. Um, I don't know how important that is, except when you put these um, early start sixth graders on a bus with uh, juniors and seniors who are used to starting at that time, um, the older children may dominate. Also, I'm concerned that on several weeks out of the year, uh, 10 minutes to 7 is dark. Many of these kids will be standing out at um, bus. And I didn't look at the almanac, so I don't know how many days, but there are enough to, to make it a point. Also, I'm concerned about the fact that there are only about 100 uh, high school students who use the bus. There are 320 middle school kids, give or take. I imagine that there's a higher percentage of middle school age kids on the bus than high school. It seems that consideration could be given to lengthening the existing bus runs to pick up those 100 students who take the bus at the high school since around 300 either take a car or a carpool with uh, an upperclassman. I can't remember what I missed. <laughs> from, is it, is it? From, your, from your coaching assignments for next year, I, it looks like about three teachers would be affected. But even, even if a teacher isn't affected, are there that many schools in the area that are released at 2 o'clock? I mean, I would think our games would still, home games would still start at 3.30, or, which is what they normally do. So you still have from 2 to 3.30 an hour and a half time that they're at school in some capacity. What is Pond Cove's uh, present starting time? It's, uh, it's 8.30. No, it's 9. 8.30. 8.35. Eight 8.30. So that stays the same. And what you're doing is just putting the middle school up into the high school. Right. So that's all. That's the only change. No. There's no, no. And, uh, Pond Cove would, would back up by 10 minutes, Barbara? Five. Five. Can you, can you, this is the first time I've heard about it, but can you explain why, again, that this is a recommendation? Sure. And number one, there are, there are 100 high school students that run the buses. That's about six runs. And you'll see, notice if you see them in the morning, you can see a bus with two or three students on it. Then they have to come back and take the runs again. And this way, by taking half of the population, we can cut down six runs. Now, that's six runs in the morning and six in the evening. Now, that's a number of runs, and the buses will be far more uh, filled, and uh, it'll be beneficial economically. Also, the two staffs will be relieved at the same time in the event they're working on curriculum meetings. As it is now, we have to wait for the other group to come, and uh, it'll save a lot of time there. Uh, I don't personally have any concerns uh, with the differences in ages on the buses. They're, they're going to be outnumbered uh, considerably with the 350 uh, versus 100. And if you break that into 12 uh, trips, that isn't very many older youngsters. What does this do as far as 
the cafeteria schedule, for example, at the middle school. Um, How does this affect that? Yeah. I'll have to ask the principal that. Does that have any effect in the middle school? Excuse me, could you repeat the question? Somebody, somebody else asked the question. No, it's middle school. It's middle, middle school. Middle school. Chris? Chris? <laughs> well, you're up. Uh, What does this do to the middle school cafeteria? It shouldn't have any effect on it at all. Same schedule. Yeah. Same time. Probably 50. and the hour between the end of school and the start of athletics by just starting the, the first group at 8 and the second group at 9. You're saying... I'm, I'm not sure what... the children that live in the Oakhurst area with two or three kids just on it and it seems as though perhaps they could walk the, the high school students could walk a, a smidge farther to catch buses <coughs> that ran on um, starting middle school I just think is very I mean obviously this is a time of saving money we can all understand be a chance if there they'd be leaving home by you know 10 eight until 11 15 a long stretch um, for I, I think that you uh, if you just new to you all I really think that maybe more thought come into some other options before you make a you would 
table it and, and um, hope to hear some other suggestions. This is not going to be acted upon tonight, but I, I'd like to just speak. I, I don't believe this is school board policy, the time that school day starts. I think this is, I, I'm happy to provide a forum for you to let the administration know that you're upset, and I think they need to listen to the parents, and I think the parents need to be aware of, of the fact that this is being considered. But, you know, this is an actual uh, administrative decision. You know, we care that there are six and a half hours in the school day. Is that right? It is six and a half. Okay. That is right. I didn't want to add 30 minutes there that weren't supposed to be there. <laughs> and, and, and how they put that together, you know, we trust that they will do it correctly. And I, I think they want to hear from you. Um, That's why I was taking this but opportunity truly, to. You know, th and this is our first look at it also. Good. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Can I speak on the, yes. the transportation issues she brought up? Uh, I agree, you know, some of our, the buses as far as the, the 912 program do come back empty and their runs probably, see what happens is that if you go from point A to point B and you got six buses out there, but from point A to point B you only pick up 20 kids, but you travel, you know, X amount of miles, you still gotta travel that same distance, whether you have 50 kids or 10 kids. Uh, that's why you know the buses do come in that empty. Uh, the high school kids do, in a lot of the the uh, streets, walk to the main streets to get the buses, and we don't go in to a lot of the developments like we do for the K five or six A program. Uh, just that there's so few kids that, that do take the bus from the nine twelve because of the enrollments. We only get four hundred twenty seven kids next year at the high school, and we just felt that. You know, by doing this, we could still have the same six buses go out, make one trip in, and then fill up the buses, and therefore eliminating that one trip in the morning, that one trip in the afternoon, which we feel is considerable savings to the districts. Yeah. So you're developing a, a program for these you know, middle school kids based on the 100 kids then that are right about. Yeah, I, I think I, I would have to agree that I'm, I'm, if there's one thing that I think every person on the board has said in the last year or two years since we've all been on here, and that is the program should be driven for the children and not for the benefit of, of bus drivers or for the fact we're going to save a couple of dollars and not put another bus out there. And I think we're talking about a radical change here in asking, you know, 350, 360 middle school students to adapt their complete schedules and their lives and change dramatically for the sake of 100 high school students and to save a couple of bus runs. Also, I think at some point we have to figure out what time these three schools start each year and leave it at that for at least a while because every year, I mean, you know, we change the time during the year this year and now we're going to change that time next year. I think that's hard on parents to, especially if they, if they have to make arrangements for kids before school or whatever, they need some stability as far as school starting and, and ending times. Let me, Madam Chairman, just indicate a few things. This, this is really far more complicated than it appears. When we do this, we do this with the administrative council and the bus, the head bus driver who sits right down and we look at all of the constraints. And remember, we have certain periods of time we have to get the kids there. And he's the only one that can say, you can't do that or you can do this or you can do the, the following. So uh, I, we really appreciate your input, but believe me, there's nothing that's been said here that we haven't discussed. Uh, how much money is at stake? Hmm. Oh, money wasn't our not chief thing. Money well, wasn't somebody said you reduced 12 bus runs yeah. and that would save some money. I'm just curious how much. Gee, I wish I could tell it's, you. It's, it's gasoline and wear and tear on the buses, Peter, basically. Well, well if it's not a big number, not even big enough to have researched, why bother to make the change? Well, the, the thing that I think that was talked about a lot was what if one school starts at the same time but yet the other school comes in five or ten minutes earlier, you know, you need to allow enough time to go from one run to another run to bring the kids back into school. Well, we've been doing that all year. True. The problem being, well, the problem, it's not a problem, the, pro the, the, the present schedule is fine. We just felt that, I mean, through our talks, that we could, we could reduce, number one, the hours that people are putting in. What this would do, okay, like barber school would get out like ten minutes earlier at night. 
Um, what would you get out? Ten. At night also? Five minutes. Yeah, I, I don't he, think I understand that. Well, he needs to, to, to go and get the uh, the K-5 population, 807 kids, we need like 45 minutes to, to an, an hour to bring in that many kids. So it is, that's two bus runs per bus, or six times two is 12 runs in the morning. So you've allowed, you've given yourself five more minutes to do that? No, by, no, by, by starting at 7.30 with the 6 to 12 program, we've given ourselves an hour to do that. or 15 more minutes. The problem is, is if, if the K, if the 912 starts by themselves as they are now, and the 6A program goes at 10 minutes of eight, I don't believe we have enough time to bring in the kids for 830 for the K-5 program. Do we this year? No, this year we've backed up. We're trying to get the kids out a little earlier at night eliminating a few bus runs at night. We're providing three late bus runs right now. We'd like to provide one for all schools. So we get buses coming and going. Uh, if you get out early, then half hour after or 45 minutes after, you get a late bus run for that particular school. What we're trying to do is, is everybody is out and by 3.30, quarter four, is have one late bus run for, for a, a one through, through a 12 program. Well, maybe you need to look at your late bus, but not adjust the whole groups of people during the whole day. Can that be done? Could, could, I mean, perhaps you might change the policy of we cannot allow, you know, staggered late buses for everyone. There will be one late bus, and it will leave at X hour. But we'll have to go and check with, with the people that do do the, the bus schedules to see how much time they do need or is allotted to run 807 kids. I believe 50 minutes to an hour is what they're going to need for time. Is part of this because we didn't get the new, a new bus? Does that have anything well, to do with it? Not really. We've put on an extra bus run uh, as of last September because we had chaos here when school started. Uh, we're running an older bus, but it, you know, it's in good condition. It's safe in that. No, it's nothing to do with Isn't it. Isn't basically the whole thing is we're running two programs, or we'd like to run two programs rather than three. If you can run two programs, you can do it in less time than you do it with three. That's basically the whole thing. But we're not a two-school district. We, we are a three-school district. And, you know, the personalities and age appropriateness of, of a high schooler and a middle schooler are different. And, and it, I mean, if we believe that, then we could put sixth, seventh, and eighth grade at the high school. And, you know, we've tried to avoid, you know, we've tried to keep them separate because we felt like they were separate. I mean, was that considered? I, as you say, you've considered all this? We've considered mostly everything except I've got to ask Frank. Did we consider changing the high school to the middle school time? Yes. There, there are some, some issues that haven't been mentioned that have to do with education that drive some of this. And I think we ought to throw that into the pot because it's very complicated. One is that we're sharing staff between the high school and middle school next year. So but aren't you sharing staff between the middle school and the elementary school? Yes, we are. And what we're trying to do is get the um, get the times congruent so that they fit, number one. We are trying to, to eliminate a bus run as, as, or a, a whole set of bus trips. Uh, we could start school at quarter of eight and get out at 2.15, but that doesn't give enough bus time to, to for, that means there, there needs to be, if you have just the two bus runs, um, that needs that hour turnaround. One of the problems with starting the high school later is that it, it impinges on a host of high school sporting events in the fall, particularly, um, which um, means we let we have to let students out of class early, or we cancel some some JV games. So what we tried to do was find a time that we thought would be an appropriate starting time for the the two schools. There are not many high school students who take the bus. I mean, in in that sense, it's not it's not a big issue for high school students. I don't think. It is certainly for those who need that bus, but in, in terms of the total high school program, an awful lot of them stay for sports, uh, probably fewer than 100 to take the bus home in the afternoon. So we just, we, we are trying to solve a, a number of problems and not create a lot. I think some points have been raised that we'll obviously go back to the drawing boards and think about it. But it's not just a, 
a transportation issue. It's not just a scheduling issue. It's not just a program issue. It's just they, they all sort of fit, and it's sort of a funny puzzle. And it was trying to get them all to, to fit correctly that uh, we came up with a solution. I, I wanted to mention the education problems, too, of sharing staff. And we are sharing staff in, the, in all three schools. Any, any other comments? Any other comments from the audience? I, I would like to make a comment that I, I, I like the idea very much of the teachers doing, having two of their work days, those last, of those first two days in January. I, I think a concern of educators and, and parents alike is are these split up weeks where the, the students are in school four days and not in school that fifth day. And I think this, to me, is a, a very good solution. It seems like a good time because they're getting back after a, a long vacation and can tie up their semester and, and begin planning for their, their next semester or, or for whatever purpose uh, they're meeting. But I, I'm particularly pleased with the, that part of the, the calendar. That seems to be a change, and, and uh, I think it's a good one. Any other comments? So you're going to take this back. We're going to take this back in the way uh, all of the uh, expressions we've heard tonight and recheck the constraints and see if we can't uh, bend a little or if we can, we'll try. If we can't, we'll come back and say this is the way we think it has to be. All right. Uh, and then the, the last point was very important because I think we're going to be sharing staff for the next two or three years, between the middle school and the high school, specifically. And uh, we've got to find a way to be able to do that. It, it is, there also is shared staff between the elementary and middle, too. Is that yes. correct? Uh -huh. But the real difficulty is when we start reducing the high school load and the middle school load, we're going to be probably doing far more in the academic areas. In the elementary, it's primarily the art and music areas and those are a little more flexible you see all right any other comments before we move on has anybody arrived that wants to speak no all right then this will be tabled until our next meeting and we'll be presented with uh, a final choice for the school calendar final suggestion uh, superintendent's report a progress report on portable classrooms Good. We'll just want to say that uh, D and the architect have been to the zoning board and it was acceptable to that board with the same conditions placed on the last portable. Uh, D and the architect and myself will go to the planning board on Tuesday. And if, uh, if uh, one or more board members would like to uh, accompany us, we'd be more than happy to uh, just call my secretary. We'll be more than happy to tell you where we are on the agenda. And sometimes if we're late, you know, you don't have to come as early. Uh, but we're hopeful uh, we have the construction permit with us now. Uh, Dee has been there today with the fireman and the architect. Uh, and I don't think we see any constraints at this point, do we? No, we, we need to address the, uh, I guess, a roadway so that emergency vehicles could get, you know, behind the buildings. We looked at that today with the uh, with the architect and also the uh, the uh, fire chief Kate Elizabeth, and along with uh, Bob Malley, the highway uh, supervisor. Uh, the state fire marshal has approved the concept of the portable. The building will be sprinkled. But what we've done is we've asked, or Dr. Pelletier wrote a memo to the town council requesting the portable for next year. We'll be addressing that through the budget process. There's no road now there, is there? There's a, oh boy. I mean, I walked it with you not too long ago. There's no, there's no road that I remember. Not per se, but what would happen is that between the, the bus garage and the, the uh, section D, I guess they call it the middle school, there is a 28 foot uh, way there where we would uh, take a bulldozer or something and, and take off the, uh, the topsoil and then put gravel. Oh, okay go to the back of the building, we'd have to take down a few trees and connect it to the road coming up with the other portable in the uh, Scott Dyer Road. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's, I don't know how much money. We're gonna have a, an excavator come over with us tomorrow and give us an estimate. 
but it needs to be done either way. And that road would be open, you know, year round, winter time especially. So that just in case. Uh, be before we move on, let, let me just make a statement so that it's perfectly clear that, that the choice for the, the, uh, the shortage of space next year uh, by the, the uh, school committee, what, and this is in answer to your question, Peter, and I'm sure other people need to understand exactly, was to ask for a portable building. And we've requested that of the town council. It has not been approved. We're hoping that it will be. That after looking at all the possibilities of what we might do in order to add classroom space, um, the choice was to to uh, obtain another portable classroom, and so that is that's the uh, the path that we're we're working on right now. And it has not been approved, but we are proceeding. Um, we have a, a time constraint because construction would need to take place immediately after school because it takes several a few months for it to be built. And so that's what we're pursuing at this time. For, make that clear to everyone so they would know that after these months of agonizing of what we were going to do for space, we have decided that a portable is in the best interest of the school system and, and the children. Uh, uh, we have a presidential scholar. Yes, I'm very pleased to say that uh, we have a finalist uh, for the presidential scholar, and it's Brian O'Donnell is the candidate He's the valedictorian of his class and is a National Merit finalist. He also ranked first in the state in the extemporaneous speaking and will attend the National Speech Competition. He's also a recipient of the Holy Cross Book Award as well as the academic awards in French, U.S. History, Physics, Trig, Geometry, and Chemistry. And we certainly would like to congratulate him and wish him well. Uh, you'll note that we had one in 83, 85, 87, and now uh, 89. Uh, Madam Chairman, this may be also an opportunity for you to congratulate uh, a few other young people who won awards. Yes, I will. Uh, can we use a little creative camera here? I, it so happens that Brian O'Donnell is also our cameraman, and so I thought perhaps <laughs> if our other cameraman might put the spotlight on him, we, <laughs> we'd like to thank him and uh, congratulate him on, on bringing honor to our school system. Brian, you're exactly <laughs> Uh, it's been called to my attention that two other students have, have uh, brought honor to themselves and to our community, and one was a young man in sixth grade named Alec Brown, who won uh, the spelling bee for the region and went on to the state spelling bee, where he, uh, according to the newspaper, I haven't talked to him, spelled uh, many words for a long period of time, and then uh, at the last, it became, it was narrowed down to two final spellers and things went awry for Alec <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, he came so close weird. and he was a runner up and he is a sixth grader and I would like to think that uh, all the hard study and, and work that he put in this last year perhaps will, will pay off next year it, it, and he'll have another opportunity but we're very proud of him. He, he, uh, was, it was just very exciting to hear of his, his good success and another young man uh, by the name of John Hall, participated in uh, an area Special Olympics consisting of 15 schools, and John came in first place in the 50-yard backstroke. And so I'd like to congratulate him. In fact, I have a picture that I think is going to perhaps be in the newspaper of John winning his 50-yard swim. So these, uh, I I'm sure there's always a lot of people that that we can congratulate, and uh, these. Are, are certainly just three examples of, of the fine work and, and uh, abilities of our students in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, a report on the meeting with the le legislators, Dr. Pelletier. Well, this is a moot point at this time, but I, I want to just indicate that a, a number of us have spent too much time in Augusta. Uh, however, uh, our final notice is that we did we will, they will restore uh, state aid to uh, our district to the tune of $31,862. Uh, but uh, I was only reporting that 10 of the superintendents were called to uh, talk with the Education Committee. Uh, there will also be cuts in the Education Department itself 
that uh, will have an effect on us and probably the biggest effect will probably be the main testing program that we'll be discussing tonight may be delayed for a year. Uh, also, uh, certification will be set back and uh, we probably will have no longer what is referred to as ISGs. These are people from the system such as Mary Bruins who go and work for the State Department. So those will be cuts that will change the program for next year. My big concern is state aid for another year uh, because this is a minor change in the formula and it will have some effect on us particularly as our properties uh, appreciate you know our formula, the formula is such that our percentage decreases and each year we are going to lose state aid and uh, that's going to have a dramatic effect on our budgets. So uh, I just think we should keep that in mind as we uh, go through this year. Charlie might like to add a few uh, comments because he also went to Augusta and met with the legislators. Um, on March 28th, I represented the school board on the Portland area, York County um, team of, the, of this education coalition that's been formed with all, all the, the main school boards association, the principals association, the main teachers association, and the superintendents association. And on that day also, we had two teachers from our system who were there, Neen Stanford and Clark Smith. And we, <coughs> we met with legislators at the, t at the state house. Uh, we personally met with Mary Webster and our Senator Barb Gill. We had luncheon with the legislators from our districts. And um, the thing that I think that came out of that was that there were no new taxes for this year from this session. Um, the legislators, I think, are aware of the impact on the local property owners by this reduction in state funding, which we're getting back a little bit of it, but it still is impacting us. But I think it's strictly a partisan issue this year. Um, the Democrats realize the funding formula needs revision and realize the need to restructure away from a, a regressive property tax um, and the need to restructure and the need to uh, approach to a more equitable form of tax structure. Are, this came out of that meeting with those legislators, but it's kind of mute for this legislative session. The other thing being that it's an election year, so no one wants to help the party. So again, um, I think the students are the ones that are going to suffer this year. Um, the legislators uh, commended us, the coalition, for its efforts, and it strongly recommended that we continue our efforts uh, through the primaries and into the um, the general election campaign in the fall, um, I got a sense that something would be done in the next legislative session to, um, to address the inequities in the tax funding formula and to somehow um, find some different tax structure that's more equitable and less regressive. And it just happens last week, um, um, there was a report card that came out on our economic economic status, and it, it gave us an A in business vitality, and it gave us a B in economic performance, but it gave us a D in development capacity, and that consisted of literacy rates, educational levels, research and development funding. So we're already flunking to some degree, and we're going to reduce the amount of, of funding, which is going to impact, I think, economically five, six years down the line. So I think we still have to push for some kind of change. Okay, thank you, Charlie. That D keeps us off the honor roll, doesn't it? Um, last month, the school board asked um, Mr. Kramer to come back and talk to us about a comparison between our eighth grade students who are now the first group of students who took the main assessment test in fourth grade and also in eighth grade. So he is here. Dr. Pelletier, did you want to say a few words? Okay, thank you. 
Um, I did the report as you had requested last time. The cover letter uh, gives the one of the reasons why we're not supposed to compare the the uh, standard scores that the school receives each year to for the two years. Um, when I identified those students who took the test both years, uh, 91 out of 122 students actually took both tests in each year, which means that 25.5% of our students uh, that were tested uh, did not, were not here to take that test back in the fourth grade. So uh, this is why we need to go the extra step and actually sort out the students who took both tests and then take a look at the specific individuals who have improved the scores, those who have not improved the scores, and those who have declined somewhat. Um, when I did that work, I made sure that I listed the very specific students identified only by number that are before you so that you can have some kind of feel for where the students scored on a percentile basis, uh, how much the actual gain was. It would have not represented much information if I had just gone to the uh, tally that I present on page four. And I'll review that just a little bit with you. In the area of reading, uh, 32 students gained four or more five or more points between the two years. Uh, 40 students declined five or more points, and 19 stayed within a, that eight-point range. In the area of math, 22 improved, 37 declined, 32 stayed the same. And in the area of writing, where we did not, where there was somewhat of a decline, if you recall, from last month's presentation, the writing was one area where we did not do quite as well as we had done over the past years. Uh, 22 improved, 43 declined, and 19 remained the same. If you go to the gender breakdown, you'll notice that the girls who scored much, who generally scored much higher and did score much higher this time also account for most of the declines in scores. I point out further in the memo that if you look at the school scores compared to the state, we improved in each category. And the differences can be accounted for, I think, through a number of different variables. Uh, some of those are the differences in populations that we're looking at. Uh, the differences are relatively small in each case so that a little bit of a variable plus or minus will account for the kinds of differences that you see here. Um, the, uh, the differences in population can be both at the state level as well as at the local level. For instance, uh, one of the things that I think that happened when the tests were first given is that um, some schools weren't as attentive to educational needs as we are in Cape Elizabeth. So I think that our original scores were very high to begin with. And uh, if you look at the backup information that I gave you in the news release from the Department of Education, you'll notice that many schools have improved considerably. So I think that many schools had a lot of catching up to do, have done some of that catching up. And that means that we are competing now probably against a, a population that is probably a little bit better educated than they were four years ago. So we have to do even better in order to keep the same scores. Because if you look at the state scores, they've improved anywhere between 10 and 10 and 50 points. You know, our scores have improved during this period, or the entire state. Uh, both have. Both have.
Any questions? Charlie? Another thing that came out of that legislative uh, lobbying day when we were talking with the legislators, there is still a lot of feeling that the MEA is not really telling us a lot. And it still is accentuating regional differences. And it's really not telling us exactly where we are as a state versus other states. So it's, it's really not telling us an awful lot. It, it's telling that we've done some improvement, but it's still, it's still pitting region against region. It's still showing, it, you know, it, all the schools have, have gotten better, but it still shows. I, I would think that would be true up until now, but now we can start comparing with ourselves. We can compare the same child in fourth grade with his, what kind of an education he's gotten for the last four years. Except for the fact that, from what I understand, the test itself has changed a fair amount in the four years. That it was in its infancy when the, they took it as fourth graders, and as eighth graders, it was almost, it was very much a different test than it had been four years ago. Is that correct? So it would be more difficult or less difficult or just different? Well, I think the writing, they, they changed considerably and what they were asking the kids to write and how they were asking them to do it. So I'm not sure that this is a comparison that, that means much of anything, mm -hmm. actually. Well, I guess that was going to be my question. What, what after you spent hours combing through the files <laughs> and preparing this wonderful report that we requested, what did it tell you? It basically points out that compared to other schools across the state, that we are we are right up there towards the top. Some years we may drop down a little bit, but still maintain scores within that third percentile above the standard, above the mean. I mean, the third standard devi deviation above the mean, which means that we're well into the upper 90th percentiles on a regular basis. Were you surprised at so many scores that were less than what they had scored in the fourth grade? You would expect that there would be more, considering that our scores continue to improve. Um, probably a lot of that difference is accounted for by the 25 percent of the students that didn't take the test both times, you see. Uh, the other thing that could have happened is that the kids who, the kids who went down may have gone down more than the kids who went up, went up, so that, uh, well, that's not in, that's a cause of concern, isn't it? It would be if it if it were a significant difference. But when you look at the total scores, when you look at the total students who went up and down uh, in the reading area, there was a difference of eight. So that if four kids had moved, it would have been exactly even. Um, in the worst case, the most negative aspect there was a difference of 23 and they're getting a 12 but that's students. out of 91 kids right out of 91 that's a large percentage right i mean it isn't isn't and go ahead i'm sorry but that, that was about on 30 percent of the kids 25 percent of the kids in the in the writing area Right. Uh, and that's the area where the girls did not do as well this year. And uh, that was identified last month through the, the score, which was 345. That was the this test, then, is not going to be given next year? Is that what I heard earlier? That's a possibility. That was a recommended uh, cut by the Education Committee. However, that has not been finalized. You know, that's all rumored. These recommendations are coming out of the House, correct? Right. Right. Any other comments? Only one. Uh, perhaps uh, this is uh, incorrect, but let me ask it. It would appear to me that you can't use this test this way diagnostically when you're in the 90th percentile. I, I, it seems to me that this really doesn't tell us anything except that you're in the 90th percentile 
and most of them score pretty high. There's nothing here that's significant in terms of some, diagnos some diagnostic uh, aspect of the class. Right. Very few diagnostic tests, for instance, would be made up of less than 50 items on a test. And that's what you're dealing with when you're looking at these numbers. Um, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that they don't give individual scores for the science, social studies, and humanities is an attempt to, quote, evaluate school systems as opposed to individuals. And what they do there is only have, they do what they call a cross matrix sampling. And that means that each student takes one twelfth of the test, so they get a very large number of items, which gives the test supposedly more validity. And when you get into that kind of a situation, that's it isn't even useful in terms of any kind of individual assessment even. I guess with all due respect, Daryl, I'm concerned and I, I don't I don't like to sit back and just crank out a lot of numbers. I mean, we, we get in trouble when we start to just look at numbers and we try to determine the success of a program or where we are with, with a program based on numbers. But since we don't have anything else to look at, when you look at 40 out of 91 students scored lower in reading than they did in fourth grade, 37 out of 91 students scored lower in math than they did four years prior, and 43 scored lower in writing. Isn't that something that we should be taking a look at? Isn't, doesn't that, isn't that a flag, Lyles, that, that we should be saying maybe there is a problem here? Should we look at this a little further? And let me add, those numbers, that doesn't mean that if 40 scored lower that, that 52 scored higher. That's right. 32 scored higher. Right. So, uh, you know, that... I don't, I, that to me bothers me. When I looked at these numbers and I started to play around with this, I said, geez, that's... That's a high percentage of students that have done less well on a test, and maybe maybe we shouldn't judge them this way, and that's, maybe that's one of the reasons the state said recommend you not look at it that way because there's some reasons that it, uh, for whatever that they don't calculate, you're comparing apples and oranges. Well, one, of the re one of the things that I did do is develop a very narrow range to arrive at the plus minus. Okay? When you're working with that kind of a narrow range, then you're going to have quite a few people falling both below and above. But in every case, they scored below. Right. Every girl, more girls scored lower in math, in reading, in writing, than scored higher this right. time around. More boys scored lower in math, reading. So there was not one area that we did that more did better than did worse. That's right. And I want to say one thing <laughs> that Mr. Garvin said. Chris, you were there. And he said that if you ever find that your testing begins to fall off, do away with the program. And so I, for one, am going to look real carefully at these. And I hope we do take them next year because to me, these numbers mean something because they really are a comparison child, the same child after having been educated four years. And I expect them to go up. He said they would go up. He said, if you're doing a true middle school, if you're truly doing whole language and meeting the child where they should be, those scores are going to go up. They're not going to go down. And the problem is there's nothing else to judge the program by unless something is developed that says we have something to measure the progress of students under the programs that we have. We have to fall back on information like this. Whether that's right or wrong, that is all we have. And when we look at numbers like this, it raises a flag in my mind that we shouldn't just slough these off and say you can't compare these because the state says you shouldn't compare them and you know there are all those reasons why there's something here that concerns me I, I agree that it raises a flag but I think we have to be careful how what test we're comparing our school system to I think that's real important I don't know whether the main state test tests the things that are important to the school system. Now, surely there are. Um, well, I would think being able to a math problem. It doesn't matter. Yeah, let me how finish, though. I mean, I, I I think that there are certain um, things like a math problem or a particular fact that yes, kids know or they don't know, and they need to be taught. 
But I don't know when we're talking about you know, critical thinking areas, the kinds of things that whole language are trying to do, is trying to do and so forth, I don't know whether that's measured. I agree with what you're saying. There are some bottom line things that all kids should know on any test they should be well, able to do. But you've seen the test. I remember you saying you got I a saw copy part of the, of the test, test and, and yeah. it was, did you say it was a good test or? Well, that was a year ago. Yeah. I, I mean, did they change? I don't know whether they change or not, but it was just, you know, I didn't see the whole test. Yeah. I saw the, the reading portion of the test. Can, can I just add a few things? Having worked on the um, you, you advisory on the committee um, for the test for four out of the five years, and having learned a tremendous amount about testing, um, this test is revised every year. So it's never exactly the same test. Revised much more carefully than other standardized national tests are simply because it's a much smaller test. We give it to a much smaller population. When these students took the writing test, for example, as fourth graders, they wrote to two prompts and they were graded or scored on a four-point scale. As eighth graders, they wrote to one prompt and were scored on a six-point scale. So it's quite a bit different. And it is revised every year. I think your point about assessment and that we need to find something to assess our progress is absolutely appropriate. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. I do know that having sat on those advisory committees that there are lots of variables that do make it very difficult to compare a student's performance in this test one year to their performance four years down the road simply because it is revised so frequently. I guess I, I would really like to see us be devising something within our system that measures very carefully <coughs> what our kids know and what we value and what we think they should know, whether it be critical thinking or, you know, statistical facts or whatever, and, and be quite, you know, firm and, and make sure that, that that is happening in our schools. Because if this isn't the right way to measure, we, we don't have any other message to send to parents other than this is the measurement and this is how the kids are doing. Well, I can't believe we have an education system here that's so exclusive that only we can measure what we're doing well within ourselves. I would think that national figures, you know, we sort of fit in sort of like the rest of the guys too. I would love There should be something tests. out there that we, we can measure ourselves against because we're going to have to live in the whole world outside of Cape Elizabeth too. And, but I'm speaking specifically to this test. I'm not speaking yeah. to national, other national tests. But OK. That's true. That stresses my point about the regionalism. It's pitting regions against regions. It's really helping the whole system. Are we helping those? We seem to score consistently well. And don't, and, and don't kid yourself. One of the problems that you have an increase in kindergarten population is because twice a year in the papers it gets published to what the school system does and, and we rank first in these tests that come along and people sit back and say where are you going to put your kids in school? We say we're going to move to Cape Elizabeth. Um, and I think that if we're going to live by the sword we also have to look at the other side of the coin and that is if, if we can look at it from a, if we can all sit back and pat ourselves on the back and thump our chest and say we're the best school system in the state and we've got the scores to prove it then the reverse is true then if we see something that doesn't look like things are kosher, then I think we're going to have to take a harder look at it. And I, I didn't have to agree with Loretta. I don't think we are so unique in our school system that we have to devise our own test. I think there should be something out there that gives us some idea of where we are on any given level with our students as they go through the program. I don't think it has to be either or, though. I think there should be both. Yeah. That's the point I was trying to make. I don't think this is the test to answer the questions we're asking. Mm -hmm. And I think there are better tests. And we have better tests right here in our own system. You mean that we are administering? Yes. There are better standardized tests to measure what we're looking for than the main assessment. That we are. I think. Now, where else are we testing on that, that is standardized that we could find probably more of what we're looking for? I worked with a committee that looked long and hard to find something better than the SRA, and it's amazingly how it's amazing how consistent those standardized tests are. And there isn't a whole lot else on the market. Uh, we looked real hard for that and contacted all the major publishers. And uh, the reports that I get from both the publishers as well as the State Department of Education people is that this is one of the better tests for 
two or three reasons. Uh, number one, it does ask more critical thinking kinds of questions. Um, it is a test where you don't just send everything off to a, a scanner that picks up the dots on an answer sheet, and many of these questions are, go, go beyond questions and ask the students to write and, evaluate, and are evaluated by teachers in a much more thorough way than picking out uh, proofreading and picking out an error in a sentence that's before you or picking out the misspelled word and filling in A, B, C, D, or E for the misspelled word. Uh, this is a much better test in that sense. Uh, the other thing that they do is have 10 open-ended questions in both the math area and the reading area <laughs> where students are, are examined on how they approach the process of solving a problem, and sometimes may be given credit if they went about it in an appropriate way and arrived at uh, more than one, they can arrive at more than one correct answer. Those are some of the reasons that are given for it. Those are some of the reasons they give for this being a, quote, better test. One other point that I want to leave you with for sure, and that is that um, when you look at testing for an individual student, you don't look at one year and find out how much that student, or, or look at just two years and find out how much that student went up or down. You need to look at a series of two or three years at least. And if we're looking at numbers of kids who do better or worse than they did four years ago, I think that we need to look at that pattern for two or three years. Uh, so I would like to see what these kind of figures look like year two, three, and four into the future. And I think that there you can pick up the pattern. I think it would be very risky to take any direction in curriculum revision or change or change any kind of philosophy until we have that two or three year message delivered to us. Um, I, you know, I can't defend it and I can't speak too much and I can't you know, do much more than stay neutral at this point because we're looking at the differences or the increases or the decreases based on one group of students. Can I read one thing that's attached to this and I, and I honestly didn't notice this until I looked at it just now. In the press release that went out, we're talking about whether or not we can compare the, the results of the tests that were taken four years ago by same, the same students. And this is what the Commissioner of Education says in her press release. This class of eighth graders is the first class to take the test as fourth graders. This allows for comparisons of scores for individual students to determine their change in relative standing. Now I think that's important because what she's saying is we can use these scores to compare whether or not they have improved or, or not improved. She does go on to say, that you can't compare, this comparison of scores for schools from four years ago today is impossible because of the change in student populations that the schools experience. So this, this has a tendency to, to contradict what we were talking about a month ago when we asked for this, and we were talking about the fact that we couldn't compare these scores because they weren't. Well, no. Well, we can't. This you, is it, student it doesn't contradict okay. it because what they said we should not, what I said we should not do last month was what is, here at the bottom third of this memo where it compares the school-wide scores. Okay. All right. Re remember, I did say that I would be willing to produce this data for right. you because that was a legitimate comparison. So then the, the information that we have is should it, concern us more because it is an accurate picture? It's accurate, but I, it's accurate, but I think that before, I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned. But at the same time, I'm saying that if I was sitting where you are, I'd have my level of consciousness raised. But at the same time, I'd want to look to see what happens next year. And then you can become more concerned or may have your concerns alleviated. Because the, the difference is not so significantly different, but what it could reverse itself next year, which would put us in a very different situation than if you see the same pattern next year. What are you going to do with these individually with the children? What are you going to do with somebody that scored a 96 in math four years ago and a 49 in math this, this time? Or what, do you, what are you going to do with somebody that scored a, uh, 
a 7071 in reading in when he when she was in fourth grade and she scored a 27 now that she's in eighth grade are you, are, are you going to use these is, is there a plan to to find out what the needs are or or a success somebody that went from a, a 34 to an 80 I mean why did it work for them and and why was it such a devastating uh, fall for other students or are you just going to put these away in their files and say that's what happened um, I have two or three responses to that number one I always have a workshop with the teachers following either following up prior to this meeting that I have with the board so that teachers many teachers have already seen this information and have used it to some extent the other part of this is that I think one of the other strengths of the program is that all of this inf information goes to the parents. So that the parents certainly are made of, aware of those. And during parent conference time, that is a uh, topic that can be discussed. Um, one of the things that Rick Madden and I have encouraged a great deal from the guidance office is yearly conferences for everyone. And if I were and I know some of the teachers, and Rick did when he was in the classroom, I used a lot of this information as part of that ongoing conferencing on a, on a yearly basis. Um, one, of, one of the other things that is most useful is that for the students, these are placed on a card so that all of our students, if a parent or a teacher wants to review this kind of progress the student makes. Um, you can sit down and if it's a sixth grader, you can see four years fluctuations uh, in, in one summary of the testing information. Um, there again, the three or four year sequence of scores is a lot more important than, than the one score. And if a student has a pattern that goes straight down, that's one thing. The other thing that happens very often is that you will see students bouncing up and down by 30 or 40 percentile points on a very regular basis. Uh, if, if you see that kind of a pattern, it's not quite as uh, meaningful as if you see a pattern that is more consistently up or more consistently down. And oftentimes, that those kind of concerns can be handled on an individual basis. On the other hand, um, I think that I can recall times when we have, as a school, addressed certain curriculum issues if we see one subject area that is significantly below the others or shows a particular pattern over two or three years. Um, one of the things that has happened, I think, is that um, as our scores have continue to increase over the past few years, those kind of concerns have diminished and um, the philosophy and the reaction of boards to these test scores are dramatically different from board to board. Madam Chairman, can I ask a question? I'd like to ask Nancy a question. I wasn't here when all this was legislated, but this was never intended to take the place of a good comprehensive testing program for a school system, was it? No, I, I think with the, the legislation and where it came from, part of the purpose was exactly the purpose that has developed, isn't that? That is to be able to compare school systems within the state and see how well they're doing. That's why I say that your teacher can, I don't see how a teacher can use this in a diagnostic way, the way she can a good standard test. If you're changing the That test. might be an interesting discussion to have sometime, Daryl. What is a good standard test? Um, because I think there's a lot of discussion about that and not a lot of agreement about what is a good standardized test. It's interesting to know, you know, we sit up here in Maine sometimes and we think, well, are we really with it? Uh, the company that's worked with the Maine Educational Assessment Division, Advanced Systems, has been contracted by the state of Michigan the state of California, uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and several others, um, I believe, to help them plan their statewide testing programs. 
And one of the things they're bringing to them is all the work that they did with us, the state of Maine, and what they learned from our experience and how they can produce a much better standardized test. So an interesting debate sometimes to have about what is a good standardized test. Do you, you worked on this. Do you think this is a good test? Oh boy, it was a lot of hours if I think it wasn't a good test. Yeah, I, I, I do think it is a good yeah, test. And I think that um, it's a test, one of the things that's good about it is that it is constantly looked at every year. In the language arts area, um, tests like SRA, um, California Basic um, Test, some of those, the reading passages are not what we call passage dependent. And that means simply that you can answer the questions without reading the passage. So therefore, it's not a, a test of reading ability so much. It may be a test of prior knowledge. It may be a test of good guessing. It could be a test of many things. In developing this test, what we've tried to do is to ask high quality questions that really do depend upon your ability to read the passages and to have longer passages. And we've worked in conjunction with the people from the state of Illinois about how to improve the tests and constantly look at it. I think when you get standardized testing companies and national testing companies, they just can't afford to change their test every year. Um, a small state like Maine that tests approximately 17,000 students at each grade level can do that. And we can look at it and change some of the questions each year. And part of that review process is going over and looking at how many students got an answer right, how many got it wrong, how many chose the next best answer, um, is there a better way we could ask the question, should we ask an entirely different question, should we ask and select entirely different passages. So the strength, I think, is in that constant review and revision. Plus, I think for language arts, it does reflect a lot of process education. It's not perfect by any means at all but it does reflect a lot of what process education encourages us to do. Well, based on what you say, then I would give the test a lot of stock and, and want our students to do well on it and continue to improve or stay the same. That would be a nice goal. Okay. Yes, I would agree. All right. I want to say one more thing, too. I, I don't need to address it to you, Nancy, but, but as far as your point about the school system, our school system being so unique, um, no, it's not unique as far as um, many others in many states. I think we've got a really fine school system that is keeping up with what many other states are doing that, that is also really fine. And from what I've read, the other states are looking at new ways to test and different ways to test. So to try and say, no, Cape Elizabeth stands alone on the whole map, of course we don't. But it sounds like the test that Nancy's describing is exactly what we try to do. We try to longer passages, understanding what you've read, writing, and, and being able to, and of course math I think would be, you know, fairly standard, and so I think the test is not a poor test. For, do, I mean, do you get that feeling that it's not probably a good test to measure what we're teaching in our school system? I don't, I don't know whether, I mean, I, yeah. But I don't want to discard it and say, well, it doesn't really matter much because what we're doing is above this. I don't want to discard it, yeah. but I sure don't want to overemphasize it either. Yeah. Well, Madam Chairman, yes. just let me one more because you're right. We need a workshop on this. And again, this is to Nancy. My concern is the superintendents who are in similar districts are finding as we change our curriculum, our test scores are going to go down. And I won't cite the place, but there's one town that's been actually recording this and as they've hit the uh, cutting edge of all the new things including higher thinking levels the test scores are going down these test scores and they've asked us to report what's happening to ours at the same time and that's a real concern of mine that uh, maybe the direction we think we'd like to go in is not the one we'd like to go into well, that, that conflicts with what I believe Dr. Garvin said and, uh, and other sources where if you have a good program, even though you cease to, quote, teach to the test, unquote, your test scores will go up. I'm not sure what test Garvin was thinking about when he said that. Right. Now, I don't, I, it was my feeling that I didn't think he was talking about the main assessment test. I think he was talking about standardized tests that are used around the country. I would um, guess he, he may have been simply because he 
has probably not had an opportunity to be that knowledgeable about our test. And also speaking to national audiences, you're going to address more the national norm than a particular state and what they're doing. I think any time you make change, you always run the risk of, of going down a little bit in your test scores. I think the important thing is not to overemphasize them, but also to be aware of what they're doing, what they're showing you, so that you can use it as improvement for your programming. Mm -hmm. I think that it would be important as a classroom teacher to look at a student who maybe in the fourth grade um, scored in the 79th or got 79 on something in the 79th percentile, and then in the eighth grade scored 49 or in the 49th percentile, I'd, I'd want to look at that and I'd want to address that. I'd want to look at some test taking variables, some test taking strategies, um, some of those kinds of things so that I could clear it up. Is the curriculum going in the right direction? What is the test telling us? Not looking for excuses, looking for explanations so that you can add to improvement. Um, I, but the MEAs, we do have to realize they are not politically accepted in all regions of the state, in all places of the state. They are something that many, many educators would like to get rid of with ease. It would be nice to do that. Um, I think they've shown us some other things for our system that we're not perhaps in that position, but I think they can force us to ask some very good questions. I think also Sue Welsh and myself, having worked on the advisory committee, we bring to you one of the things the MEA has done for us is to help instruct us in how to construct a test. Instruct us in how to construct a test, let's say it that way. Um, and how to put together some things so that when we do have the time and the money to develop some curriculum-based assessments, we can do it in a very appropriate way. I would also be interested to see how we grade our students, what these eighth graders' final grade was, to see if there's any disparity there also. If, we're, if it's just the fact that some of these kids don't test well, don't take tests well, or if there's some inequity, say a child's getting an A or B and is, is and it had, it had dropped in his, in the, two, in the four years. I would like to uh, look at a copy, and I can't recall whether I've seen one before, of the record, Lyle, that you keep for each uh, student and you know how these test scores are recorded on that and compared with other, other tests. Uh, I think the only other point I, I, or question that I have, and I've been uncharacteristically silent when there are a lot of numbers on the table. But uh, I, I'm frustrated by this arithmetic anomaly where you have the school's performance rising over the, uh, the four-year period, and yet you show so many declines. And uh, it either could be accounted for by the, I assume, by the students who weren't tested on the second go-round in the eighth grade, and the fact that you've chosen five points as the, as the cutoff, you might have, uh, curiously enough, you might have an average of eight points on the decline and ten points on the rise, or vice versa. Is that, does that make any sense to you? Would that, maybe you and I should spend some time. I'm sort of curious about that because it doesn't, on the surface, it doesn't make sense. Uh, one a lot of smart kids have moved into town since fourth grade. <laughs> well, it may be. <laughs> That's, uh, that that may be the, uh, the reason. But I'd like to maybe spend some time with you individually on those two subjects. Okay. This is going to be a characteristically short meeting. <laughs> it's now 10 after 9. Are, can, can, are we all ready to move on? Um, the school board workshops, Dr. Pelletier? I'm suggesting... Uh, two dates for the curriculum and the career ladder workshop, May 1 and May 22nd, the high school library. All right, does that does meet that everyone's that? schedule? What's the date of the next school board meeting? Eight. Eight. So May the 8th, I believe. Yes. Next school board meeting. Okay. At 6 o'clock, Workshop with cafeteria, 7.30 be the regular meeting. So that would be a meeting May 8th, May 1st, May 8th, and May 22nd. Okay. okay. All right. This will the workshops in your office. Madam Chairman, want the workshop upstairs? Yes. All right. Sounds fine. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure we 
we indicate that when yes. we put it out. When, when that's published. Connie. All right, we'll move on to the board chairman's report. At this time, we uh, need to take a vote as a board on the uh, our recommended budget for our 1990-91 school year. Uh, this budget will be for $9,027,196. Uh, this is a $907,000 increase over last year, which is 11.1% increase. Um, the board has worked many hours. The administrators have worked many hours, and the teachers have worked many hours, I'm sure. And uh, many original items and requests have been cut. And uh, in our judgment, this is the budget that we are ready to present to the town council and feel like it is a, a, a budget that, that we are, are proud of and feel like we have um, prepared uh, to the best of our ability. Do I hear a motion that we uh, accept this budget and, pre and present it to our town council? So moved. Second. All in favor? Opposed? All right. We'll move on to old business. And that includes a consideration of a change in a school board policy, which is the child abuse and neglect policy. This is the second reading, and tonight this will be uh, voted upon by the board. Do I hear a motion that we accept the uh, school board policy, child abuse and neglect? So moved. All right, do I hear a second? second. All right, are, are there, is there any discussion? All right, I, I, I do wanna say that this policy has been worked on for many months and uh, a lot of work has been put in on it. Uh, I wanna give special thanks to Gail Parker, who has spent a great deal of time in, in uh, research and in helping write this policy. Um, and this particular month is uh, Child Abuse, National Child Abuse Prevention Month. And uh, so it's fitting that this be voted upon at this time by our board. All in favor of accepting this policy as school board policy? Opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on to new business. The superintendent has his recommendations for coaches for 1990-91. I think we have those lists in front of us. Any comments, Dr. Pelletier? None whatsoever, except that uh, we will all, always fill coaching positions in the summer, and we'll bring those to you in the fall. Okay. Do I hear a motion that I have we... A yes. question. <clears throat> For some reason this year, I again noticed that we only have an eighth grade baseball coach, and I believe we, and we have no seventh grade baseball coach at this time for next year, but I also believe that's the same situation now, that seventh and eighth grade are, are one team now, because we only have one coach, so. I can't answer that. Is that right, Mr. Middle School Principal? I believe there are 39 kids that signed, that went out for 7th and 8th grade baseball and there's only one coach. Okay. But 39? 39. Yeah. I understand that this year they're cutting kids from the team and that's something that is new. Okay. Uh, so, I wish I'd like to make that very clear. Since our new AD uh, has joined us, we've had a no-cut policy. And where we even think about it, I come to the board or I, I find money so that we don't cut. We haven't cut anyone that I know of in two or three years. I think there are some children that have misunderstood them. Good, I would like to know that so I could straighten that out. Appreciate that. So who is the seventh grade coach? It is Mark who is Jean son. Okay. Do I hear a motion? Oh, is there any other questions? All right. Do I hear a motion that we accept the uh, coaching assignments for the 1990-91 school year? So moved. So moved. Second. Okay. No. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? All right. We now have a consideration of a request by the superintendent to enter executive session for the purposes of discussing negotiations and personnel matters.
But before we do that, I would like to make a note of two dates to remember. One is our May school board meeting, which was mentioned a moment ago, which will be at 6 o'clock on May 8th. And the, uh, there are two joint budget meetings with the town council. The first will be in two days, this Thursday, April 12th at 7 p.m. Will that be in the chambers? Yes. It will be here in, in the, uh, the town hall chambers. Uh, this is certainly an open meeting, and anyone interested in the public would, would certainly be uh, invited to attend. Uh, the school and community services will also meet with the town council on Monday, April 23rd at 7.30 here in the council's chambers. All right. And now do I hear a motion that we enter executive session? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Opposed? All right. The meeting is adjourned. Peter, any other suggestions?